Today we are in the Gospel of John, chapter 8. The last time we ended with verse 51. So, you know, this is, we're going to end the chapter today. This has been a great chapter. Lots of practical things to learn. A little bit of conflict, uh, especially in the early chapter. Early in the chapter, we saw where the, uh, the Jewish leaders in, in Jesus' time actually came into the temple, interrupting Jesus while he was teaching and uh, trying to trick him into saying something they could use against him. Of course, that failed pretty miserably. And several times we see his responses actually caused people, more people to believe in him. And they were, that, was, that was the opposite of what they were trying to get them to do. So it kept backfiring on these leaders. They kept getting madder and madder and, and more desperate as the chapter goes on. And we kind of have the climax today of, of that happening. And to pick up some context, I'm going to back up to verse 48 and go from there. So John chapter 8, verse 48. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I do, and I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, now we know you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets. And you say, if anyone keeps my words, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Good question. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is the Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say, I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father, Abraham, rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You're not yet 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? <laughs> Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Wow. There's a lot we can see in this chapter. I uh, just want to remind you, when we see the term the Jews... In the Gospel of John, most often it's referring to the Jewish religious leaders who were kind of a religious and political force there in Israel. Uh, Israel was under Roman occupation at the time, and, and since the Romans pretty much let the religious leaders run Israel, and as long as there weren't problems, Rome was getting their taxes, they were okay with that. They came in and messed things up once in a while, but... Um, the leaders tried to uh, have a kind of a divided allegiance between the Romans and to God. Okay, It seemed when there was a conflict that might cause them problems or they might lose power, instead of God, they chose Rome. And uh, they, they didn't realize that when the Messiah would come, the kingdom would be a spiritual kingdom. It would last, so far it's lasted over 2,000 years or around 2,000 years. They did not understand that. Instead, they were pretty much terrified at the prospect that the common people would come, follow Jesus, and make him an earthly king. So that would make the Romans attack them because of, what? There is no king but Caesar, right? And it would take away these leaders' prestige and, and any power that they held over the, the Jewish common people. So uh, what they were doing, they were discrediting Jesus at every turn. Um, they were trying to find now, they were trying to find a way to kill him. On this day, Jesus had been telling people that believing in him and following him and knowing the truth would bring them true freedom. <laughs> now, these leaders were kind of freaking out at this point. Uh, they realized that they, they didn't realize that the, the freedom was not uh, a political freedom, but one that touched the very hearts and souls of the men for eternity. But still, because they didn't understand, they, they tried to discredit Jesus, make him look bad push people away from him on every turn. But the more they did that, the more the truth came out, the more people, more and more people continued to believe in him. And with 
no possible way to, to lodge a religious complaint or, or really even point out any sin, sin of Jesus, they reverted back to name calling, uh, innuendos. Uh, they were trying to build themselves up by tearing Jesus down. And so that's where we kind of left off last time that the Jews answered Jesus and said, do we not rightly say you're a Samaritan? Um, that was supposed to be an insult <laughs> and have a demon. Verse 49, Jesus answered, I do not have a de demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Verse 50, I know, do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Now, these people, they could have done the right thing at that point. They could have followed the word of God. It's what they should have been teaching the people, the scriptures, the scriptures both, you know, all through the Old Testament pointed to Jesus. That's the scriptures they're talking about. But Jesus' enemies didn't repent. They actually missed a wonderful opportunity to have their lives changed for eternity. And, you know, I don't, I don't, don't want friends of ours. We don't want a family. We don't want, I don't want you. We don't want people we come in contact to miss that opportunity. And that's one of the reasons why we study the Word of God deeper uh, and, and learn these lessons from Jesus. One of the things that's, that, um, you know, he didn't do when they insulted him, he didn't really respond to that. Or when they tried to insult him, he didn't respond to that. But he couldn't let that remark about being demon-possessed, um, he couldn't let that go by. He, he had to produce a denial because it was, it was definitely a false charge against him. It was dishonoring, it was disrespectful, and it was coming from hearts that were full of sin, full of darkness. And so what Jesus did here is he contrasted himself to those leaders by, by telling them he's not seeking his own glory, but that God the Father is the one that brings glory to Jesus. And he also let them know that the judge they would have to answer to was God himself as well. So, you know, Jesus wasn't seeking that honor and respect and acceptance from man. He was pretty much indifferent to it. He didn't care. I mean, honestly, he didn't care. Now, I'm not saying he didn't care about people. He greatly cares for them and for every one of us. But he didn't care in, um, in a selfish way. It's, it's not that he was feasting on being accepted by people. Um, he wasn't looking to get to say something and put a statement on Facebook and get a thousand likes for his, you know, for, for his post. Uh, instead, he was engaging in this conflict in order to help them understand the ways of God, that they can know the truth. He wanted that. He never sought revenge for what men did or thought against him. That's diff so different from the worldly way, isn't it? Uh, he, he did know, he did know that judgments were coming upon the nation of Israel. Um, and he knew because of their, what they, when they would reject him and the evil things they did against him, that there would be such judgment, but they could be avoided if the people would just repent. And repentance is just changing your mind, turning around, and going the other way. Now, Jesus then brought it back to those who were in the group with him. Uh, he, remember, he was teaching in the temple. For those that wanted to know, to know more about the freedom that he was talking about, and the eternal life he kept talking about, and they were not disappointed. So in verse 51, is when he said, most assuredly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. We talked about that last week, and you know, I, I just thought about that through, through the week. The more I think about what Jesus meant here, the more meaningful it becomes. If anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. You know, the, the unforgiven, people that are unforgiven cannot see death. I mean, they, they cannot help but see death, as a scary, terrifying, unknown thing, gloom and doom. You know, in the past year, we've, we've experienced a, an entire world that, it, that sees and is focusing on the possibility that less than one half of 1% of people dying from a, uh, from a new disease that came out. I mean, and they're terrified. The whole life, everything in life, in public life has changed completely. It's just, it's just inside out and upside down because of possibility of a half of 1% of people dying of something. But keeping the word of Jesus Christ, 
He says, as you continue in his word, as you keep his word, you're completely turned around. Your back is turned to death. Death is behind you. You will not see that. Now, um, you know, will I ever physically die? Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I hope that Jesus, at some point, if he comes back and takes me, you know, before that happens to my body, um, that would be nice. But as I get older, I realize the chances are less and less. This physical body is not going to last that much longer. And so this body will probably die. But I will never see the gloom of death. I will never see the doom of death because I will never experience the horrors that an unforgiving soul, unforgiven soul, would experience at death. And that's what Jesus wants for everyone. No fear, no dread, but total peace about a transition to the world. Uh, and uh, the world is so, so terrifying even to think about it. So we have a wonderful life lesson. When we completely trust in Jesus, we will never look at death with dread and horror. When we completely trust in Jesus, we will never look at death with dread and horror. You know, I tell people a lot, when you know where you're going, it's a whole lot easier to take the journey to get there. So in verse 52, the response, the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our, than our father, Abraham, who is dead, and the prophets who are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Now, as, as odd as it sounds, um, when Jesus said, made this claim about never seeing death, if you follow me, uh, it kind of delighted them in a, in a really twisted sort of way. <laughs> and why is that? Well, they, they, they understand very clearly what he's saying. They believe they finally caught him in blasphemy, and they're trying to pull it out of him. They knew he was claiming to be greater than their father Abraham. Of course, they refused to believe that Jesus claimed to grant eternal life and didn't even understand what that meant, but they knew what he was claiming. In fact, we know that the religious leaders here uh, actually twisted the words of Jesus. Did you, did you catch that when they spoke back to him? Jesus said the one who keeps his word would never see death. That is, they would never stare into the face of death, dwelling on it, let it controlling their thoughts in their lives. You would never see death. But notice what they came back to him saying. They claimed if anyone keeps his word, they would never taste death. And there's a difference. Yes, most believers will indeed taste death as you pass through it, you know, but... You're not going to live in it. You know, I might, I might taste a good supper or a bad piece of meat, but I'm not going to live in that for eternity. So the wonderful reality, though, is that we are never going to be terrorized by death. Jesus has already defeated that foe. Uh, we, we see when Paul was writing to encourage Timothy, he reminded him of that in a very practical way. So in Timothy, uh, chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 to 12, saying, Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel, according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose, and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And here's the key. Who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him until that day. And what day is it we're talking about, that, that he's talking about? Well, either the day that he would go and see Jesus or Jesus would come and get him. You know, either way. It didn't matter to Paul one way or the other. Why? Well, he just told us Christ abolished death and brought life and immortality through the gospel. 
In Colossians, we're told in chapter 2, verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he, that is Jesus, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. So again, we see Jesus triumphs over the power of death, and it's nothing for us to fear. We also read in the next chapter of Colossians as that thought continues, if, you were, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. And further, uh, chapter three, verses 12 to 17, therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. He's telling us how to live in light of that. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. <laughs> wow, <laughs> what a blessed and happy life. A great description of that life you can live when you don't see death, when you're not staring at the, at the bad things about, about the death and, and destruction, but instead you see the eternal life and, and good life that Jesus has promised you as you keep his word. So another life lesson for us today is don't be fearful of what will happen on earth. Instead, keep your sights on higher things that Christ promises. Don't be fearful of what will happen on earth. Instead, keep your sights on the higher things that Christ promises. So I wonder just a little bit, but these, these verses just explain more of that life that he's talking about, that, uh, that, uh, that we will never see death, that we'll never dwell in death. So coming back to our text, uh, the leaders here were, were finally, they, when he said that, they were finally uh, said, okay, we got them. They were boldly challenging Jesus. They're trying to get him to say in their words what he'd been telling them for years. In God's words, and that is that He is the Son of God. He is divine. He is eternal. And, you know, we, we, these things we've seen over and over in just a few chapters that we've gone through in the, in the book of John so far. And um, it, it kind of seems like they're wanting to force Jesus to, to brag, so to speak, on who He is, really. And so what does Jesus say? Verse 44, I mean 54. Verse 54, Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. <laughs> In other words, I'm not going to brag on myself. Then he continues, it is my father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet, you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Before Jesus answered their question in verse 53, are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead and the prophets who are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? He came back to the matter of spiritual parentage. Who's our spiritual heritage? Jesus was so incredibly secure. There was no doubt he knew God was his father. He matter-of-factly states, it is my father who honors me. You have not known him, but I know him. We've seen the religious leaders, even a few verses earlier, claim that the Father in heaven was their God and their Father. But it was not a true claim. In truth, they didn't know God, but Jesus did. Jesus knew what was at stake. And he, when he answered the question here to them, he knew if he claimed that God was indeed his Father, like father-son relationship, not just an a, through Abraham, but it would, it would likely seal an earthly death, a death sentence for him, okay? They, he knew they'd accuse him of blasphemy. He knew they'd double down on trying to kill him just as soon as they could. However, there was a much worse penalty at stake. What if he went the other way? 
if he tried to lie, if he lied to save his earthly skin, his earthly physical life, denying that he was indeed the Son of God, that he knew God personally, what would be? What would happen? It would be sin in the flesh. He was certainly conflicted. Okay? I mean, being human, we don't want someone to kill us, <laughs> attack our bodies, okay? <laughs> that's something that's very common. And, and so in the flesh, he was conflicted, but he could not lie. He could not um, deny his knowledge that God was his father and, and how he had a relationship with God the Father. And, and so he demonstrated to us how to live life in obedience to God's word right there. So despite what he, that, that he knew what was coming, Jesus told them, if I say I don't know him, which is kind of like what you guys want me to do, then I'd be a liar. But I do know him, and I keep his word. So there. <laughs> I've got to tell you the truth. I'm not going to lie to you. What Jesus, Jesus demonstrates for us is that what we've been talking about. He was looking not towards death, not afraid of death, not fearing that. He was not looking towards um, earthly things. He was looking towards heavenly things. What's eternal? Not looking at and seeing physical death, not dwelling on the doom, but again, doing the right thing no matter what the cost. Knowing that spiritual rewards were much greater than any physical cost that it would cost him by, by doing the right thing. And what we see here in, at the end of chapter 8 is that Jesus is crossing kind of a point of no return. We see different phases in the gospel. He's crossing the point of no return, so to speak, and he's speaking clearly about who he was. He speaks so plainly to him, they were totally shocked as he continued and said the next thing. Verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. <laughs> They're flabbergasted. Verse 57, then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham, who lived you know, hundreds of years before. Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Oh boy, <laughs> it was on. Verse 59, then they took up stones to throw at him. Not just to, to play catch, okay? And they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So Jesus had made this remarkable claim, answering their big questions, and, you know, Jesus claimed that he was not only greater than Abraham, but that Abraham himself actually acknowledged this. What do you say? Abraham rejoiced to see my day. What? When did that happen? You know, it could have been multiple times. Um, one of the things is back in Genesis 22, 8, we see when he was taking Isaac up to the way of the, the place of sacrifice. And what was interesting, too, about the, in, in Genesis 22, in, in that account, is that's the first place in the scriptures where love is mentioned. It talked about that Abraham loved his son Isaac, just as God the Father loved his son Jesus. And it also is the first mention of a lamb. And we saw back at the beginning of the Gospel of John where, where the, uh, John the baptizer said, Behold the Lamb of God. And all through history, you know, the Lamb was the perfect sacrifice. And yet, back in Genesis 22, we see the first mention of that Lamb. And uh, on the way to the place of sacrifice, Isaac's looking around and saying, oh, Dad, where's the sacrifice here? You know, we're, we're going up to make a sacrifice. Where is it? I believe he, Abraham could very possibly, through divine wisdom, divine knowledge, have actually seen, at least in the spirit, God, he said, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. God himself will provide a lamb for the burnt offering. Um, also in Genesis 24, um, some rabbis think that as, as Abraham was passing, in Genesis 24, 1, in our English Bible, it says, when Abraham was old and well stricken in age. Sound, sounds repetitive, right? And when Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. 
Well, it's interesting to note that the Hebrew expression which is stated, the second thing, was well stricken in age. It was also taken to translate, went into the days, or went into the, to the ages. And so many rabbis think that actually Abraham, that God showed Abraham what was going to happen with his seed. I mean, he didn't have that many kids when he died. You know, he just knew that there were some kids coming along and there were some of his seeds. But, uh, you know, it makes a lot of sense because the meaning is so deeper in so many passages than a casual reading reveals. You remember God's promise to Abraham was so big, so incredibly far-reaching, it was unbelievable. And yet at the end of his life, the Bible said, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So it's, I think it's very possible that that in all things included revealing to Abraham that the promised one would, that would come through his family, bless all the nations, was indeed Jesus, the divine one, and showed him before he died a glimpse of the future and, and uh, personally showed him Jesus in that. So anyway, it's just interesting to see the, the nuances of just a few words in here. But yes, the people made no mistake about what Jesus was saying here. They said, you're not yet 50 years old, and yet you've seen Abraham. And the remarkable statement that Abraham saw and acknowledged the greatness of Jesus, um, you know, was, it's more than they could understand. They just couldn't figure it out. Why? I think because they hadn't said, studied the scriptures. If they had studied the scriptures, they'd have known the things that, I, that we just talked about here. They'd have known that Abraham, you know, talked about God providing a lamb for the sacrifice that, that you know, God had seen into the future. I mean, Abraham had seen into the future. I'm sorry, guys. Sometimes the words don't come out the way I mean them. I hope you understand. But last week I said something about the, Jesus provided the sin. That was not what I meant. I said Jesus, <laughs> what I meant, Jesus provided the, the uh, offering for sin, <laughs> the forgiveness of sin. Anyway, I'm wondering if I just said something uh, off there. But anyway, they, they said to, to Jesus, how could you... How could you know that Abraham rejoiced in him? You know, were you there? You're less than 50. He's obviously less than 50. They're saying, you're a young man. You're still in your prime of life. You're not old enough to even to retire from, from serving in the temple. And uh, how could you see him? And again, Jesus' response is very clear. Before Abraham was, I am. Doesn't make sense, but it made sense to them. They knew when someone would say, I am, with that dramatic phrase, Jesus told them that he was indeed the eternal God, existing not only to the, during the time of Abraham, but also into eternity, past, before Abraham. Jesus claimed to be the great I Am, the voice of the covenant of God, uh, the, the God of Israel, revealed centuries before that. And this is the third time in this very chapter that Jesus uses that phrase, I Am. He used it back in verses 24 and verse 28, Again, in verse 58, and, you know, when we read it in the New Testament, it's the Greek phrase, the same one we talked about several chapters ago, is uh, ego emai, which is the same term used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament in Jesus' day to describe the voice from the burning bush. You know, using the phrase I am, Jesus used a term that was clearly a divine title belonging only to Yahweh, alone. It was interpreted as such they knew exactly what I was talking about. You know, people say, <laughs> people say, uh, you know, just casually reading this, you know, before Abraham was, I am. And if they knew that Abraham had lived so long before, they might just think, oh, this guy's just a little bit off. You know, he's, he doesn't know what he's talking about. That's nothing to take and stone somebody for. So they knew what he was saying. I am was recognized as a title of divinity, a, a deity to the Jews. So again, Jesus was telling them before Abraham came into existence, I am eternally existent. No stronger affirmation of pre-existence occurs anywhere in the scriptures or out of the scriptures. Now, if Jesus' claim wasn't well-founded, then yes, his words would be blasphemy and he would deserve death. But he was only using the language that only God could use in that situation. And so what happened? They took up stones to throw at him. It demonstrates that the religious leaders understood what he meant. They, he claimed to be God. They regarded it, that as blasphemy. They felt he was worthy of the death penalty. 
<clears throat> they intended to carry it out right then. Okay? They, they weren't going to send them to the court and you know, go through appeals. Okay? It wasn't going to happen. At this point, all they could see was red. They were crazy, mad. Uh, they didn't care that the Roman law of the land did not allow for them to execute somebody. They intended to kill Jesus right there by mob action, and there was not any civil, civil authority that would care. You know, um, their passions were aroused, they were incensed, uh, they took the law into their own hands. And do you remember where Jesus is at at this time? He was in the temple. Yeah, the, the, the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, I, I, don't, I guess they figured we'll kill him, we'll bury the body, the Romans will never know, they'll wonder what happened to the guy. But they were there in God's house where the Son of God was there teaching. Okay, they looked around. They pick up stones that maybe were left over as they were constructing the, the court of the Gentiles there. You know, the court of the Gentiles was the place, like about 19 acres there, where they were supposed to bring people in from other nations and show them how great God was and reach out to them. Instead, they were trying to kill God, the Son of God, at that spot. Instead of taking the glory of God to all the nations. Wow. They, they were claiming to be of Abraham. Claiming to know God. And doing what? Trying to kill the promise of Abraham. The one who God promised to bless all the people of all the nations. Uh, they, they just simply refused to comprehend uh, or even acknowledge these things. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, it's wow. I mean, I'm just amazed by that. So our life lesson for us. What do we pull out of this? Sometimes we just need God to show up and save us from ourselves, from our own ignorance and actions, okay? Sometimes we just need God to show up and save us from ourselves, from our own ignorance and actions. Why do I say that? Well, because that's what we're going to see happen. Somehow, it says, Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them. Some people think, miraculously, he just disappeared. Uh, I, I don't see a, I don't see him talking about that, so I'm not sure how how he did it. Uh, but they wanted to kill Jesus, but that was not going to happen. Why? Well, as we learned in previous teachings, over and over, his hour had not yet come. It wasn't time for it to happen. So he just walked out there, right by them. I mean, it says going through the midst of them. He went right through them, and they didn't even notice. Their hatred had literally. Their, their, their blind rage was literally a blind rage. They, they couldn't even see him. He probably just mixed with the other crowd, maybe the other believers that were there, and just slipped out and walked in freedom to do the rest of the work the Father had commissioned for him to do here on earth before his hour did come. And it was, again, it was about six months later when, when uh, it was time for his sacrifice. So the remarkable theme of uh, throughout this whole chapter is is so strong here at the end of the chapter jesus is in perfect unity with god the father because he himself is god those who reject jesus reject him because why their spiritual parentage is not of god oh yeah they might have they might have you know being a religion or being a you know they might be in a good church they might have parents that really believe in God, but they personally have rejected uh, who God really is. Our spiritual parentage is of the utmost importance, and it's revealed by our response to Jesus. Um, you know, ask ourselves, who is my spiritual father? Who is your spiritual father? Spiritually, who are you following? You can prove this by your actions as well as claiming it with your words. And brothers and sisters, there is hope today. There continues to be hope and freedom found in Christ Jesus. Hope to be free from the curse of sin and death, putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to provide that forgiveness for your sins, to give you real, true, everlasting life. And embrace that, okay? Um, I, I trust, I hope every one of you have done that already, but I just ask you to embrace that and I pray that you'll experience that freedom from living a defeated Christian life, that you're living in and abiding in the words of Christ. I hope you're, you're living as a disciple of the Lord, serving him, not wandering aimlessly. I pray that all this, the truth is being revealed to you day by day 
in your heart and mind, unhindered by the darkness of the enemy, and also through you to other people. Um, and that's something you grow in. So, you know, if you're struggling in any, any of these areas, you're not alone. A lot of people are doing that. We've all struggled there and, and likely will continue to, to have these struggles until, um, until we breathe that last breath here and, and cross over. But we don't have to live in defeat. Live in victory over sin. Enjoy freedom in Christ today. And, uh, you know, we'd love to chat with you some more about that if you'd like. If you have some needs, we'd love to pray with you. But I, as we close out here, I'd like to pray a blessing over you from God's Word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen.